Recently, Shinji Mikami and Jun Takeuchi sat down and reminisced about their experiences working on Resident Evil over the last 25 years. The conversation took place in a bar named Shuten Bar 5 in Osaka City in Japan. The bar with meat, beer, cocktails and guns. That's right, you can conduct a business meeting while unloading a P90 in their gun range. But don't worry, they're all just model guns with rubber bullets. At least I think they are. Let's talk about some Resident Evil. Like I said, Shinji Mikami tells us about his experience working on the Resident Evil franchise, as well as his inspirations. He also tells us what he aspires to do in the future. Jun Takeuchi was responsible for overseeing the development of Resident Evil 7 and Resident Evil Village. He has worked on Resident Evil games since 1996 in various roles. Shinji Mikami directed Resident Evil in 1996, as well as its remake in 2002. He also directed Resident Evil 4. To start the discussion, Jun asks Shinji if they could have a frank conversation about Resident Evil's development. Shinji says it was a rough project, with a light at the end of the tunnel, to which Jun responds, you're not wrong there. He continues, the thing that stuck with me was working with the soft image software. We were using indie workstations from Silicon Graphics. Those workstations weren't powerful enough. They broke. Shinji adds, that's right. Indie isn't powerful enough, and even when they were running, they were supposed to create CGI graphics, but they couldn't have because they don't have the specs for that. I'll elaborate on what they're talking about here. Almost all development of Resident Evil was done on silicone graphics hardware, using the software program Soft Image. The PlayStation was chosen as a lead platform because the development team felt it was the most appropriate for the game in terms of using such things as the amount of polygons. Development continues like that, and when things came to a standstill we went to another team that had been working on CG for a few years and begged them to help us. Things gradually started to pick up, and at that moment, like you said, the indie machines broke. We didn't have the software. In the end, our boss, Takuru Fujiwara, said, I'll tell you what, I'll bring in some folks so we can split day and night shifts. The people on the night shifts were getting out of bed at what should have been quitting time. We did that, and by the end, we were all dead on our feet. The development team had upwards of 80 people towards the end of the game's development. Jun says, Then there was talk we wouldn't make it on time. We had lots of ups and downs. I thought it was a real shame that, that other character. Shinji remembers, Oh yes, him. He was dropped about six months into development. Was it that early? Jun asks. The game was in development for over two and a half years, and that guy was gone by the end of year one. Didn't he have a gun in his pants or something? He did. We planned a character like Eddie Murphy. He had a police-issued gun which he had sold in a pawn shop. So then he had to buy a random used gun to replace it, which he kept shoved in his pants. At least that was the plan. We had some pretty serious cutscenes where he'd be cracking jokes and playing around. The character Shinji is referring to is likely Dewey. He was intended to be an unlockable character that would serve as comic relief against some of the darker material in the game. But once we thought about it and looked at the budget, he vanished. I wanted to include him, but couldn't. Now you've got project managers cutting stuff like that out, it makes the director's job a lot easier. I kept thinking, but what if, maybe this, maybe not, fine, cut him. Announcing it to the team, once I told them, that was it, no bringing him back. Games now, even small games, cost a lot to develop. They are so expensive. The budget for the quiz game I was on as a newbie was 8,800,000 yen. Not only was it cheap, but it only took three people to make. It took three people, three months. If someone tried to pitch a game with a team of three people in three months now, I'd say there's no way. Then again, we did start at 5am every day. 
Every morning the senior programmers all had bloodshot eyes, they used eye drops, it was like a horror movie. They were red like vampires. <laughs> After that, right around the time we made Dino Crisis, I met the author of the Shinjuku Shark novels, Aramasa Oshawa, in Tokyo. I met him at the flagship office, and he said, Games have gotten so samey now that they need so much capital. He really hit the nail on the head. The high cost of development means there's so much pressure, you absolutely cannot risk failure. I love the Mega Drive generation. Games like Altered Beast, Golden Axe, and Alien Syndrome. They did whatever they wanted. That's a bad way to put it, but I feel like that. It wasn't about how many copies they sold, it was about how fun they were to play. It's super basic. First off, something that scares you. You can play it or see it and you say, whoa, scary. But there are things that scare the players that don't scare me. Or things that scare me that don't scare the players. But as long as it's scary, it's horror. So for example, Alien, Grizzly, those sorts of old movies. People consider Jaws to be a horror movie, right? As long as it's scary, it's horror. But when horror really took off, I watched a ton of movies. I can't help but pick up on the horror conventions. This happens, so that's going to happen. You see through the plot. But when that happens, it's not scary anymore. If I find Hook, something that scares me, I'd like to give horror another go. Something where if I released it, even the biggest horror fans, the ones who've studied the genre and know all the tricks, I want something that would surprise even them. I really want there to be a game that will make people run in fear. Whether I make it or someone else makes it. When I have fresh ideas, sometimes I worry that someone else will get there first. I think every creative person wants to be the first person to do something. When we started working on Resident Evil 7, we went back to the what's horror anyways question. I talked about it a lot with Nakanishi. So what are we going to do? We talked about that stuff even before starting to work on Resident Evil 7. And right around that time, there was a big marketing push at Capcom, a big push, saying, we have to make games that the players are asking for. So we were being told, make this, make that. It was really hard on the directors at the time. Online multiplayer this, downloadable content that, ongoing service games, microtransactions, make a Resident Evil game, that ticks all of these boxes. There were so many demands. These poor directors. Finally our president, Tuji Mojo, stepped in. He had heard about all of the unsuccessful attempts at this point. So this was one of those unforgettable moments to me. It was January 4th, the first working day of the new year. The president called me into his office. Resident Evil 7 is in pretty bad shape. Takeuchi-kun, step in and help make it. So that's how I ended up working on Resident Evil 7. We talked about putting on Nakanishi as director. He was probably the best director we had on staff at the time, so I pushed to get him on the project. Here's the stuff we need to work out. So first we decided Resident Evil's roots are in horror. We talked about it a lot. The idea of multiplayer got written off quickly. We went down the list chopping them out until we had Markadon's worst nightmare, a regular old single player horror game. That's what we ended up with. What we ultimately wanted to make was exactly what you were saying, Megami-san. A game that's scary for the players and creators. We wanted to see if we could really make something like that. We had these preconceived rules for Resident Evil, and we said forget those. One of the first things Nakanashi brought up was how herbs are in every Resident Evil game. We talked about having a scene where the player's leg is cut off, so you pick up a herb to heal. The player chomps down and spits it right back out. Why would this be able to heal me? We talked about that. Funny, 
very funny. I actually like stuff like that. You have stuff like first person shooters where you can get shot five times in a row and not die. And people who don't play games are like, excuse me, is the main character a robot or something? <laughs> Do they have some kind of special ability that lets them regenerate health? It's just how it is in video games. So in Resident Evil, you've got those photorealistic vases with bullets hidden inside of them. Or in Metal Gear Solid, where items just float in the air, spinning and spinning like this. Resident Evil is actually in a strange spot. It started off as a half assed attempt at realism. It's weird to think about that. But then in Resident Evil 7, we went the other way, so to speak. You've got the main character getting his hand chopped off, but then the very next scene it's back on his wrist. Normally you would think, oh, I guess somebody surgically reattached it. But instead we decided to include a cutscene, with the girl stapling the hand back on. You might say that makes it even weirder, but it's a horror game. Weird is good, right? And when you turn a crank or something, the main character says stuff like, what's the deal with this house? This is insane. This house is nuts, that sort of thing. It actually grows on you and becomes part of the fun. When you're making something, you're in that serious mode. Adding some bits of laughter sort of loosens things up. It makes the next scary moment hit just that little bit harder. If it's always pressure, 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 it stops being entertaining, it's boring. You can't even breathe, it's like you're underwater. Whoa! This hall is dangerous. There must be a back door somewhere. Let's try to find it first, shall we? Just a moment. I found something. What is it? It's a weapon. It's really powerful, especially against living things. You know, to be honest with you, the ones I worked on, so Resident Evil 1 and 4. Resident Evil 1 was the first one obviously, but Resident Evil 4, it has to be Resident Evil 4 for me, that camera angle, right? Different from third person shooters, back then, even now, kind of from behind, I mean, that angle, even now I think it was a really good idea. It felt natural. Oddly enough, we didn't set out to do something that innovative, but in the end, everybody kept saying we did. To us personally, we just thought that angle was better. We weren't trying to do something new or groundbreaking. There was none of that. The first person who praised the camera system in Resident Evil 4 was actually Masahiro Sakurai, the guy who makes the Smash Brothers. He came to check out the game in development and asked, who came up with this camera system? Yeah, that was me. This is great, he responded. Whoa, really? I said. During the development of Lost Planet, at our first E3, we were approached by the Gears of War team. They were all around us checking out the Lost Planet camera. A bunch of them were asking why we weren't using the Resident Evil 4 camera in the game. We were like, well it's a completely different game. They said, we based the Gears of War camera on Resident Evil 4. Here, check this out, they said. It's weird, it doesn't really hit you, even with all the praise. You're not like, I did it. You're more like, this ought to work, I guess. Like in a fight, when you punch them in the gut, even if you were holding back, when you see the other guy keel over in pain, you think, whoa, that got them, that did it. It wasn't part of the Resident Evil 4 team at all. The entire game felt super fresh to me. I played a bunch and thought it was weird and fun. That Robo Salazar part really blew me away. That wasn't in the game at first. One of the animators started saying the game felt too serious. They said, let's go a little wild. How about we add a robot? <laughs> what was that all about? I bet they grinned like a child when they said that. Absolutely. Anyways, we felt as if the game was getting a bit boring around the midpoint. We were trying to think of ways to liven things up when one of the animators said they really liked the robot idea. So we thought, screw it, let's add the robot. <laughs> Sounds like the story was drafted quickly. That was rough, let me tell you. 
I wrote the story for Code Veronica and also Resident Evil 2. I went to the late Noburo Sugimura Sensei. I said Sensei. I always called him Sensei. I said Sensei, I need your help with Resident Evil 4. I went over the details of the project with him. He said, got it. He asked me how long he had to come up with something and I said, one month. He was like, hold on a sec, hold on a sec. He said, that long just for the concept, right? I told him no, it was for the complete first draft. He can make edits later, but I need the first draft in a month. He said that was impossible, but I told him he was the only person I could ask. Anyone else would have slapped me silly. <laughs> when I said that, he said he would have to think about it, but then was like, no, I don't think I can do it. I said, okay, fine, I'll handle it myself. So Sujimura sensei went back to Tokyo, and I wrote the first draft. <laughs> I was able to finish the whole thing in about two weeks. I went home after work and started writing around 8 or 9 p.m., and kept going until about 5 or 6 the next morning. I went into the office midday and kept that up for two weeks. That was a special case though, since we had no time. We couldn't finish enemy designs until the story was done. Actually, most of the enemy designs were already done. So basically, you just guessed while you wrote, yes. Wow, that's incredible. It was crazy. I'd say about 80% of the enemy designs were already done. So I just had to guess as I wrote. We seriously had no time. We were under so much pressure, there was no time to think. But thanks to the team coming together, we really made something great. It was one hell of a dream we had. Things sometimes got a little messy with so many moving parts, but it all worked out in the end. Were there any small details you obsessed over that no one ever noticed? This wasn't one of mine, but I do remember Camille obsessing over whether Leon's belt was dark brown or black in Resident Evil 2. You remember that? Whether it was dark brown or black turned into a big thing. He said, Takeuchi, look at this. This is dark brown. This is black. The thing is, back then, the texture for the belt was only two pixels in size. You couldn't really tell the difference between brown and black. I told him either works, but he got super upset and told me he thought he'd never hear me say something like that. <laughs> Kamiya was pretty young back then. It was his first time directing, right? I was watching you guys during the whole thing. That kind of detail might not amount to much, but people like him, you know, they have their own ideas, and to them, it's one part of ensuring the quality of the game. They are in no small way contributing to that. I've been trying to keep my obsessions to the bare minimum, but maybe I should start leaning into them some more. Yes, please do. If I do that, it'll be like when I worked on God Hand. That was a game I could really pour myself into. I worked on that after Resident Evil 4. There are basically two different types of marketing. One where you take something new and try to make a hit. And one where you position something similar to an existing series which should make an easy success. Personally I feel most people in marketing gather past data then use that to create a rule as to what logically makes a hit. Look at Jerry Bruckheimer's pirate movies. A pirate movie like that had never been done before, but he decided to make one. So why did he make it? By all accounts, the data showed it would fail, but he picked up on something, a scent, a scent of success. Now that's looking at what happened retrospectively. But nowadays it's always do this, do that, you definitely can't do something like that. But creators want more. They want freedom. Society nowadays does a lot to keep that feeling in check. There was something about that era of pirates. A sense of freedom people yearned for. 
I thought it was a really good idea to tap into those sentiments. I think it was the first time a game successfully scared players. It was a new thing back then, and no other games were doing what we did. In other games you'd be running from ghosts or whatever. But even in those horror games, you could defeat enemies. The experiences in our game was rare back then. So you have that, and we also have a movie-like quality to the game. The game came out on PlayStation, which appealed to adult gamers, who were in their 20s and were able to buy this sort of game. It was a good fit for them. Personally for me, there's the whole firing of the guns. You could see casings flying everywhere. That's a key aspect of Resident Evil. The cool guns. There weren't really any games that depicted guns more realistically then. I seriously consider this a huge part of the draw of Resident Evil. We have zombies and guns. To be honest with you, I never thought Resident Evil would have lasted 25 years. Me neither. Over the past few years, people have started to realise that there are true Resident Evil fans out there. Right, we are really grateful for that. The one I've enjoyed most recently would have to be Resident Evil 7. That was amazing. <laughs> it was insanely good. Ever since Resident Evil 4, for me, the best one has been Resident Evil 7. Someone on my team who'd been playing Resident Evil for a long time also praised Resident Evil 7 highly. They liked Resident Evil 8 as well, so I asked them which one they liked more, 7 or 8, and they said 8. When I asked them why, they said even though Resident Evil 7 was great for the horror, Resident Evil has always been really lacking when it comes to continuity with the previous games. That's why they, a fan of the whole series, liked Resident Evil 8. When it comes to deciding between Resident Evil 7 and 8, the fact that some people choose 8, it's because their favourite characters and the world are the same. Which makes it feel like a true continuation of the series. A lot of fans have been feeling that way recently. Probably in the last 4 or 5 years I'd say. I mean, I had nothing to do with that. Still, to hear it from you makes me so happy I could cry. Focusing on horror was good, and when it came to directing, as with other titles, each director did their own thing, and brought something great to the table. Yes, it's not as if the brand was created by one person, but rather a passing of the torch from one team to another, with each team bringing their own ideas to the series. Resident Evil is really a series that is brought together by their teams. Maybe there are times where it's tough and we've gone too far to turn back now, but players have stuck with us and appreciate the team's efforts, talking about how much they're looking forward to the next entry. Really, the past 25 years were a joint effort between the creators and the players. <laughs> so, that's it. It was nice to see two friends reminisce about their time together working on Resident Evil. Japanese game development can often be closed off from the public eye and shrouded in mystery so it was refreshing to see these developers order some cocktails and shoot the shit, quite literally.